One of the best feelings you could have playing poker outside of winning a huge pot is when you are so locked in that you're able to predict your opponent's holdings. And it's even more satisfying when you're able to do it against a very strong opponent. In this video, we'll be reviewing a hand where two crushers are able to do just that in a 100k buy-in high roller. A lot, a lot of bubble, more even, you know, usually sit and go bubbles are oftentimes more extreme than even uh, MTT bubbles. So I would imagine that Dvoris has a very strong mind for ICM. Always love to see you know when we get in those situations on the bubble and the final table and you talk about oh this player's making this adjustment maybe it's for icm because he's deviating from a standard play divorce is a guy who uh i would watch really closely in those spots to see the deviations he's making in particular because i would ex i would imagine he's sharper than most seven four for lolliger the defender out of the big here against Kale Burns, who's at it again this time. So Kale opens it up on the cutoff with ace queen off and Linus with around 34 big blinds makes what appears to be a loose defend with a 7-4 off. The flop comes 3-8-9 and the action goes check check. So Kale could definitely bet here with a tighter range and with the proportional advantage in sets and over pairs, but although Linus's range is quite wide, he does have plenty of 9x, 8x, and 3x, including of the offsuit varieties. And even many of his weakest hands have some sort of draw with the open ender, gut shot, or double backdoors. He also has many combos with two strong overs such as ace jack, ace 10, king jack, and king 10, including some with the additional equity of the backdoor flush draw. And being in late position with the ante in play, the cutoff has plenty of weak hands itself, so it does a significant amount of checking. Against certain players, you could probably get away with betting at a much higher frequency, even perhaps range betting, but of course Linus is a totally different animal. One of his favorite hobbies is to check raise bullshit hands from the big blind, so with him you need to tread lightly, especially with combos that have an incentive to realize, such as ace-queen, particularly with a heart that doesn't block Linus's backdoor flush draws. I'm with ace-queen and a check back on the 9-8 tray board brings a Jack on the turn, giving Burns a gut shot straight draw. Same story for Lolliger. He's got the bad end though. The turn is the Jack of Spades and Linus pros with around a 70% bet. Interestingly, the solver prefers the block here, which is likely a function of the turn card that is relatively dynamic. As we know, the in-position player's betting range tends to be more polar. This means that when he checks back, in most situations it will make his range simultaneously weaker and stronger. The bottom part of his range becomes stronger because many of its weakest hands should have bet to leverage the nut advantage, but the top part of its range becomes weaker because many of its strongest hands should have bet to start building the pot. That being said, the in-position player has the advantage of possibly having its range uncapped by the new board card before his opponent has the chance to counterattack. In contrast, the out-of-position player isn't afforded the same luxury. If it checks, the in-position player gets to react immediately, which is part of the reason why the out-of-position player tends to do more slow playing, which protects its checking range. So how do we know if a new board card uncaps a player's range? Well, as is the case with most rational decisions in poker, it comes down to range construction. We need to think of the most likely hands that would check back in Kale's shoes and how those hands interact with the new board card. In this case, one of Kale's most likely checkbacks is probably ace high, like the one he's holding. So if an ace rolls off on the turn, it would likely, at least to some degree, uncap his range. However, this jack turn isn't clearly more beneficial to Kale's checkback range relative to Linus's range, which was kept fully intact with his check on the flop as the outed position preflop caller. In fact, Linus is more likely to have made a straight since Kale probably should have been betting many of his straight draws, Queen-10 and 10-7. Linus probably has more Jack-9 in his range as well because Kale should have bet many of his top pairs for value and or protection. So one of the main impacts of this card is to shift downwards the strength of many of the hands in Kale's checkback range, ace highs, lower pairs, and trash, which are now more likely to fold versus a smaller bet. In contrast, if the turn was a brick, something like the deuce of hearts, 
we see that the betting strategy becomes much more polar, favoring the larger sizing. This is because the two doesn't dramatically shift the equities of the players, so Kale's mid-heavy range at the end of the flop through his check remains mostly mid-heavy at the beginning of the turn. To further illustrate this point, let's take a look at how the equity profiles of the most prominent hand classes in Kale's range change from the flop to turn, comparing the jack turn to the deuce turn. With the jack turn, we see that Kale's 9x, which were red on the flop, are now orange on the turn. However, on the deuce turn, 9x remains red. Kale's 8x, previously all orange on the flop, start to change to yellow on the jack, but remain mostly orange on the deuce. Lower pairs, which were yellow on the flop, turn mostly green on the jack, but remain yellow on the deuce. And ace highs, which were yellow and green on the flop, are now green and blue on the jack turn, but remain yellow and green on the deuce turn. So given the jack turn, we should expect to see a decent amount of small bets by Linus, but Linus's specific combo actually does not fire at all. The gut shot has lower equity compared to the straight and flush draws in his range, and the solver generally prefers not to be on the ass end of straights, since even if your hand is made, you will sometimes be dominated. So here the solver prefers to fire combos with stronger draws, particularly higher end gut shots and gut shots that have overcards. Now it could be the case that betting this hand with this sizing was more of an exploitative play by Linus, which would be consistent with him defending preflop wider than optimal. Maybe he thinks Kale's checkback range is overly pair heavy with little trash. Or perhaps in these types of turn spots, Linus only uses the larger sizing, which is a common way that many simplify the game tree. That being said, there are some downsides to that approach. Some justify pruning the game tree by showing that the aggregate EV does not materially change from a more complex tree. However, it is not possible for humans to actually capture all of the potential EV from any solution, and pruning game trees excessively can cause ripple effects in downstream strategies. For example, if we remove the big blind's ability to make this small bet, and then cause the big blind to check, we see that the cutoff's response changes in a not insignificant way. It basically only uses the full pot sizing when betting and checks more often. Whereas when we allow the big blind to make the smaller bet and force a check, the cutoff splits its betting range into the third pot, two thirds pot, and full pot sizings. That is, when we force the big blind to use a polar betting strategy, its check range will be more mid heavy, prompting the cutoff to bet bigger. But when we allow the big blind to use smaller bets, its check range is more merged, which prompts the cutoff to bet smaller to target autofolds. Granted, this is a subtle difference, but something to keep in mind for those that like to use very simplified game trees. It changes the relative equity distributions and range shapes of the players, which in turn can change the optimal strategies in later nodes with a compounding effect. This size makes makes it a little uncomfortable for ace queen. Twenty five K into thirty five. With a strong ace, two overs, and a gut shot, ace queen is essentially a pure defend and could even be raised, particularly with the flush blocker. Burns makes the call and the river pairs Lolliger seven. Porter was straight out there though. Very interesting card. Lolliger checks this over. I feel like Burns is very reasonably likely to bluff this. Ace high, no pair. He doesn't have that many unpaired combos and he's unblocking spades. But Lolliger might also decide to bluff this combo. Okay, he doesn't. The river is a seven of diamonds and Linus checks his pair of sevens. With four to a straight now on the board, this river shifts the equity distribution of the players yet again. With almost half of Kale's range having mediocre or poor equity, the solver prefers the small bet out of position, but a larger bet can also be justified targeting the cutoff's bluff catchers. However, Linus's hand, and essentially the entire middle part of the big blind's range, prefers to just check here, as these hands are unlikely to be called by worse on this runout even against the smaller bet. That is, even some of Kale's bluff catchers on this type of board could have Linus beat. Also, although Linus's hand doesn't have great equity, it is at least ahead of some of Kale's likely give ups, and Linus also has a number of unmade hands that would be better bluffing candidates with lower EV in the checking line, such as Queen X or possibly lower ranked busted flush draws. 
I expect Kale to bluff this a decent amount, and usually when I'm in the booth saying, I think Kale might bluff here, I mean, he, he, he's done it almost every time, so sooner or later he's going to pass a spot. I think I say he bluffs, but so far it hasn't happened. not that easy for him to have no pairs here, and he would love to get one pair to fold. 55. Yeah, I like it, Kale. Facing the check, Kale recognizes that Linus is likely pair heavy, and so he decides to turn his hand into a bluff, firing a two-thirds pot bet. Although ace high will oftentimes not be the best bluffing candidate, in this case, with the runout and Linus's check, Kale's ace high has very low showdown value. Also, it's not blocking a huge proportion of Linus's folding range since 1. Linus lost some of his ace high by probing the turn, and 2. Linus should have in theory been bluffing some of his remaining ace high on the river with this runout. And finally, Kale should have plenty of 10x in his range, which means that he needs to have a decent number of weak hands to fire his bluffs and he doesn't have many here on the river given the runout, which gave him a bunch of pairs, and the fact that he called the turn bet, which means he should have lost many of his weakest hands in his folding line. This, I, I like this bluff, makes a lot of sense, and I, I really don't see how Linus can call here with a seven. That would be a pretty insane call. But if he doesn't give Kale credit for a 10, sure. is there a way to do something heroic here? I mean, Kale could be betting, you know, a good two pair here, two pair plus. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, sometimes you take some of your worst kind of checks and turn them into check raise bluffs. We've seen players do this consistently. So he, me with a seven. he could do that. Oh my goodness, he called with a seven. I got a fucking seven. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Didn't. Lolliger flicks the call in there. Just pure give up the rule. And burns. Boy, you feeling the sting and the disrespect of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn. What a call by Linus. Oh man. I mean, Linus here's the thing that we're getting to watch. Who called? It's looking for king queen. With four to a straight now on the board, Kale's bet is quite polarizing. There may be some two pairs and sets mixed in since he didn't overbet, but in position on the river, his middling hands prefer to fully realize, which renders his remaining range mostly straights and trash. So this means that Linus's hand, though not strong, is a possible bluff catching candidate. And here on the river, Linus's only consideration to differentiate which bluff catcher should call and which should fold will be card removal. If we isolate Kale's straights, we see that the most prevalent 10x combos are Jack-10, 10, 10-9, and 10-8 that had pairs plus straight draws on the turn versus Linus's relatively large bet. So ideally, Linus will want to prioritize bluff catchers that have a Jack-9 or 8 because this would reduce the likelihood of Kale holding value. And what about Kale's bluffs? Well, the hands that were most likely to call the turn bet and still be unmade on the river are Queen X straight draws, with the additional incremental equity of either an over or a spade flush draw. Although normally, bluffing busted flush draws is not preferred, in this case, most of Linus's folding range are actually weak pairs, not busted flush draws. So this means that Linus's best bluff catching candidates will not have a queen or a spade. In that light, Linus's specific hand, seven of hearts, four of spades, is kind of a mixed candidate. On the positive side, he doesn't have a queen, but on the negative side, he doesn't have a jack, nine or eight, and he has a spade. In other words, it's a hand that could probably go either way. He likely has better bluff catchers, such as anything with a jack, and he also likely has some weaker bluff catchers as well, basically anything with a queen. So in a spot like this, you could probably just flip a coin, or if you think Kale is over bluffing, just call, or if you think Kale is under bluffing, just fold. But in this case, Linus does make the hero call and takes down the pot. It's looking for King Queen. There goes 